Thank you so much for having me in your house. First and foremost, Welcome. look at this mug. Rio Labe. He's just off He's camera there. Oh, Lord. It's nice to see it's you, my friend. Nice to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. Nice to be in your own house. Thank you for having me. She's, very, uh, she's a hospitable host. Let's just cut to the chase. You won an Olympic gold medal a few months ago, and I think every single Canadian has watched you win that gold. PK standing on the line, huge grim, huge grin. <laughs> Was it a grin or was it a grimace? Deep dive, psycho. <laughs> Give me the psychology behind that facial expression. Honestly, like the only, I get asked this all the time. And the only thing that comes to my mind is literally just pure joy and happiness. Like I, I can't say anything other than it was so genuine. Like I remember being on that line and I remember just thinking like, you're playing in a shootout of an Olympic gold medal final. Like this is so surreal and you've been dreaming about this moment for years and like working so hard for this moment. And, you know, maybe not a PK moment, but nevertheless, the moment was there. And I was just like, so at peace and calm. And I was just so present in the moment that I was just having the greatest time. So you were like a little, it, it sounds like you were almost like a little kid just playing it. A game you love. Yes. Like there was just this pure, yeah, joy. And, um, I will say, you know, with that, there was a bit of, of games happening where I wanted to like kind of show, I think maybe accentuate how much fun I was having and the joy and how confident and like prepared I felt, um, hoping that, you know, maybe it would make the opposition second guess their shot just a little bit. <laughs> um, but it really was like so genuine. I, I really was like so happy in that moment and, and really enjoying it. Did you ever think you'd get into politics knowing that you were named the uh, <laughs> national defense minister like that? <laughs> Honestly, no. Uh, I'm like one of the least controversial people. I don't like having uh, arguments or anything like that. So politics is not something for me, but I'll, I'll take that title and I'll uh, defend uh, the flag, you know, with the Canadian crest on my on my chest uh, on the field, but eh, off the field, I'll, I'll leave that to the others. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, thank you for having me in your home. Uh, I obviously look up to you for a number of reasons. Of course, what you've done on the pitch and what you've done off the pitch and something very close to my heart as well as uh, I think a lot of Canadians' hearts is the conversation around mental health and you've been such a champion there. You struggled though in the Olympic tournament a little bit. You had a physical injury, you did something to your ribs and that physical injury kind of manifested into a mental concern. What, what did that look like? What did it feel like? What was going through your head? Yeah. I think I've only really come to clarity of it all after the Olympics of like what actually went down. The more I've talked about it, the more I've worked with my sports psychologist, the more I've really kind of dived into the whole experience. Um, but I guess my best like summary of it would be the past year and a half, not only for myself, but you know, for everyone around the world has been challenging. There's been so much mm -hmm. added stress, added information from elsewhere. Um, for me, you know, like watching the news, social media, like there's so much coming in. And I think that compounded with preparing for an Olympic games, not knowing what position I was going to be in terms of goalkeeping with the team. You know, I didn't, know that entire year um whether i was going to be the starter or not i didn't really know until three days before our first game against japan that i was going to be playing so the internal battle of that um the stress of that compounded with the stress of the pandemic um i think i was carrying a weight of stress that i didn't realize or i was carrying some extra yeah stress i guess is, is the best word um and when i got that injury in the first game like the i remember the initial thoughts right away where number one i knew it was like serious in a sense and number two um the first thoughts that went through my mind were like did i just go through all of that to now be yeah. done already 60th minute of the first game and is this it is this my olympic exper experience is this over um that quickly you know adrenaline kicked in pretty soon after those thoughts and um, allowed me to kind of push through a little bit of pain for a little bit. Um, but then I think the, what happened over the next couple of days with the injury, um, being in and out of the hospital, getting tests done, cause I had a lot of fluid and blood in my chest. Um, the, the mental aspect of the, the weight of the injury compounded with the weight of what I was already carrying, 
um, from the past year and a half. I think the collision of the two um, just created for like my bucket was overfilled. Um, so it was already kind of at the, the top and I didn't realize that. Uh, and then I think the injury just kind of, yeah, compounded, overflowed my bucket. And um, it just hit the point where my body was so overstimulated um, and I wasn't able to come back down to like a relaxed state. So, uh, yeah, I want to go there because after you win gold, you know, in my mind, you're going to party, you're going to be with loved ones, you're going to be with your teammates. Of course, it looked a little different because it was in Tokyo and we're in a pandemic, but you struggled to come down from that. And, and a lot of athletes do struggle with this. You finish mm-hmm. a game at midnight, you don't have a very good sleep, let's be honest, because your adrenals are taxed to the limit. But yours were so, so fatigued that you like were an insomniac for a few days. But had that happened before? Like, why? I've never experienced anything like it before. Um, it actually started right after the quarterfinal. Um, the way that we beat Brazil in the PK shootout, um, the way that I performed in that PK shootout, it like the adrenaline rush, the excitement of that game, um, getting us back to the semifinals. Um, I hit a high after that. And from that game on, I didn't come down. It was like if what felt like almost two weeks. Um, so between the quarterfinal and the final, like I wasn't able to train, um, the thought of going to the meal hall, um, seeing all the people like walking through the village, just the thought of those things was like spiraling me into anxiety attacks. Um, I was really fortunate to have Quinn as my roommate and they were so supportive and would like kind of help talk me through things. And, um, all I wanted to do was lay in bed, lay in a dark room. Um, like going to meetings was like a big, um, like it took so much out of me to just like do things, to leave my room, to do things. Um, which was very hard because I'm a very social person Mm -hmm. and I love hanging out with the team. Um, you know, our team is very close. So all I wanted to do was like hang out with people and, and feel their support, but, um, I couldn't get out of bed. I was just sleeping as much as I could. Um, and so in my mind, I thought after the, I remember going into the final and thinking like, you have 90 minutes, you know, what turned into 120 minutes and maybe a little bit more, (laughs) you have this. And when it's over, like it's over, you don't have to get back, like try to relax and get back up for another game. Like you can actually just take a deep breath. And I thought when the final whistle blew that that was going to be it. And like you said, like it just, it doesn't just change overnight. Like it's not something that with the snap of a fingers or or the blow of a whistle that it's just going to end. Um, it's a, a real, challenge and it's a real thing that um you know I was dealing with and I know a lot of people around the world deal with it in different different ways shapes and forms and um for me yeah it was the 48 hours after all I wanted to do was celebrate with the team and you know there's photos of the team after the game we got back to the village I think it was around 3 a.m or something and there's photos where the team like went out to the Olympic rings and we're getting photos it was like with sunset 4 or 5 a.m and I'm not in them because I you know was in bed um just trying to like clear my head and just like relax. And, um, that was like, yeah, it was a big struggle. When did you get that moment to relax where your shoulders, you know, you could kind of just accept what you had just achieved? Honestly, like it took, I don't know if it kind of like came in stages. Um, I remember coming home, uh, back to Canada and my partner and I went, um, camping for four days. We unplugged, like turned our phones off, had no service. Um, that I think gave me one step of release, um, where I was able to kind of dissociate myself with the Olympics and kind of see myself in a new environment. Um, changing your environment definitely helps. Uh, and then I, you know, a couple of days later I saw my family and then the excitement kind of comes back again. And then I was moving to France to a new environment. Um, so a lot of it came back again, like the adrenaline rush of being in a new environment, new team. Um, but it was about a month after the Olympics. Um, I remember I finally, had this like revelation where I woke up one day and I was like, I'm ready to talk about it. Like I'm ready to talk about the Olympics. I'm ready to start doing interviews now. I'm ready to talk to media. Like I'm ready to reconnect with my family and friends and, and really share this moment with them. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was about a month later where I really felt that connection again. You have written and spoken so candidly, um, obviously from Rio 2016, you won a bronze medal and you struggled with that a little bit in the sense that you felt as though people were so drawn to the metal that um, it kind of dehumanized you a little bit. What was different with Tokyo 2020 with a gold medal than Rio with a bronze medal? 
I think first, firstly, like I went into Tokyo with that experience of yeah. Rio. So I, I understood what happened and I had done so much work to get beyond that and to, to re re establish kind of that story, um, and that feeling and that connection with the metal. So I think going into Tokyo, I already had that learning experience. Um, and secondly, I think because Tokyo was such a different experience in terms of my own challenges that I went through, um, that first month after the Olympics, like the metal, it's, it's not that it was like, it identified me. It's almost like I was so dissociated from it because I, like I had this block in my body of the Olympics, like just the thought of the Olympics or like talking about it would bring back all of the adrenaline, all the emotions. So I kind of just like avoided talking about it and I almost like pushed it away in a sense. Um, but it was when I finally had that sense of relaxation and that sense of like coming back to it that um, I think all the joy and excitement of the medal like came back. And um, yeah, I think my prior experience definitely helped with that. Um, but also, you know, it happened in 2016, but I think just how massive this was for the program. Um, I think being a part of that was just so humbling. And so, um, I feel so grateful to be a part of like such a legacy that this team has built over the years. Um, you know, and it's not just this team in 2020, it started back in, pff, don't even know when it started, you know, <laughs> yes. But like, I mean, specifically, like I look back to the team in 2012, like they really laid the foundation and, and those players are, are heroes to me. And, um, looking back at that, like what we were able to accomplish is because of what those players did. Hard not to bring up the goat's name, Christine Sinclair. <laughs> um, it really felt from a sports fan's perspective that the entire world and the entire football world rallied around this accomplishment that she, you know, finally achieved a gold medal around her neck. What did that feel like as a teammate and as obviously an integral role in the win. Yeah. I mean, you know, Sinky has forever been one of the greatest players of all time, not only in Canada, but in the world. And, you know, that was the thing she was missing. She, she has all the individual accolades, um, but to get that team, uh, team win. And, you know, if anyone knows Sinky, they know that that's all she actually cares about is the team wins and, and the team success. Um, so to finally have that, um, check that off her bucket list and be a part of that. I think it's, um, yeah, it was really, really special. And to see the, the former players, the current players, like from around the world that spoke up, you know, I think specifically there was a video that came out of Abby Wambach. Um, I couldn't believe that. I always, I, her. Yes. I always assumed those two were like arch nemeses. I know, but like seeing that, I was just like, <laughs> this, this is how big it is. And yeah. this is like, Sinky means so much to the sport. Um, the way that she carries herself, the, the way that she, has gone through her career, um, the things that she's stood up for. I think it's, it was just such an amazing moment. And to be a part of that, like to see her finally get that gold medal was so, so special. What about uh, the young guns coming up, like the Jesse Flemings, the Julia Grossos? What, what did the win feel like uh, celebrating alongside them? Yeah, I think there was so many great things about this, but, you know, I look at those players and some of them, you know, have two Olympic medals around their necks already and they're in their mid twenties. and it's just like, come on, right? Now. Life isn't fair yeah. sometimes. <laughs> and I mean, I just think, you know, when I was younger, like we had to fight tooth and nail um, for things. And these younger players now, all they know is success. And I think that is such a great thing for this program and for the future of this program. When they step on the field, that belief and that like expectation to win is there. Um, and it's like, you know, the belief comes with facts. I think that's something that, you know, when we were younger, we believed, but like, it's hard to believe when you don't have the facts to support it. Mm -hmm. and, and these players have that. And um, I think this tournament was an amazing moment for them because they were integral to our win. It wasn't just the veterans that, you know, created or, or helped this, this gold medal come to life. Like the, the middle group and the, the mid to late twenties. And then, you know, the youngsters, like they stepped up in the big moments. And I think that was really, really fun for myself as a veteran and towards the end of my career, um, to see those moments because, um, you know, seeing them shine and, and be so confident and be themselves on, on the world's biggest stage is, you know, you feel like a little bit of a proud mom. <laughs> I've got to ask, and before I ask, congratulations. 
Thank you. When you announce retirement, it is incredibly awkward because people don't know what to say. <laughs> Condolences, congratulations. You heard, I'm saying it to camera. You heard it here first. You say congratulations. Congrats on such a formidable career. But I've got to ask, why now? Yeah, I truly feel that I have given everything to the sport. Um, I feel, you know what they say, you know, going into a game, leave everything you have on the field. Like, I feel like in my career, I have done that. Like, I feel like I've, I've given everything. I've left everything on the field. I feel like physically, mentally, emotionally, like I've given so much to the sport. Um, I've picked up and moved around the world. I've played for different pro teams. Um, I've been to the Olympics. I've been to World Cups. I now have a gold medal. I have a bronze medal. Um, I really just feel like I've given everything and I've gotten so much back that it's like I'm at that point of peace. And um, people have always told me because I've been talking about it for, you know, a year and a half, two years. Um, you know, I, I knew Tokyo was coming up and then Tokyo kind of got delayed. And so I, it's kind of been like dragging on a bit. And there was always a piece of me that thought I'm going to retire after Tokyo, but there was still a bit of like unsettling and people always said, you know, when you know, you know, and in my head, I was like, well, I think I know, but do I know? Like there was still like something unsettling or turmoil, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel fully confident, but now it's like, it just like clicked. And it just, I just hit this moment where I was like, I'm ready. And I think it really just felt like, you know, my career hasn't been easy. Like I haven't just been given things. I've had to work so hard throughout it. I've, I've been in some really challenging environments and challenging situations. And I think through all of that, I've learned so much about myself and grown so much, but I've also, like I said, just poured my heart and soul into the sport and into everything that I've had to do to get to where I am. So I feel like my tank is empty and um, I'm confident about that. Like I feel so at peace and uh, yeah, it just feels, it feels like the right time. And when you know, you know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> does it, does it make it easier or harder though to retire after such an amazing win? Yeah, I think that's actually a really challenging thing for me because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people say go out on a high. Like, you don't want to go out when you're on a low because whatever. But Very like, few people get that privilege, yes, though, as well. Yes, 100%. Yeah. But yeah. also, you know, they say go out on a high, and then you're on a high, and everyone's like, well, you're still playing so well, and you're so good. Like, why are you stopping now? Like, you're still healthy. You know, it's like people always have an opinion, and mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, only you know when it's right. And, yeah. um you know, like you said, not everyone gets to go out on a high. So the fact that I do and the fact that I get to go out in my own choice, because um, I also know that a lot of athletes don't get to go out on their own choice. There's a lot of other things that come into play and, and that can also be very challenging. So I think for me, I feel very grateful that I'm able to make this decision and I feel super confident in it. And yeah, I just, I, I know the time's right. You've had such a formidable career. You've played all around the world. Um, you've taken Rio all around the world, your dog. If reincarnation is a thing, I would like to be reincarnated <laughs> into your dog, to be honest. Your His cat's poor is pretty full now. <laughs> <laughs> He's a well-traveled dog. But uh, what are some of the nicer memories that you have through your uh, soccer career that the media might not know of? Yeah, it's a really tough one because honestly, like, there's so many amazing moments. And I think... I can't even remember so many of them, but you know, I have some wine with some friends and maybe some more memories will come up. <laughs> um, for sure. I, I remember a lot of, uh, you know, with the national team, we used to go to Brazil every December for this like four nations tournament. And we always had this Christmas exchange, um, party. And I remember those were always fun. There's been some pretty epic gifts, um, given, uh, so that was always, um, really fun memories. And then I think for me, it was just like, being able to experience like World Cups and Olympics, like highs and lows, even like the absolute lows, but to experience that with some of your closest friends and, and the people that are so close to you, I think like it just builds this unbreakable bond with people that um, is so hard to describe. Like, you know, I'm, I'm really close with a lot of, a couple of my high school friends and, and I have a childhood friend that I'm super close with, but like, the, the experiences and the memories that you make with teammates, um, they see you at your absolute worst and they see you at your absolute best. And like those bonds are so incredibly strong. And um, I think like the best memories I have are just like hanging out in the room, like on away trips um, with my teammates and just like having some laughs. 
like the most mundane moments, like playing <laughs> yes. Settlers of Catan. I don't like yes. board games, but I don't like board games. I know you love them. I'm sorry. You always try and bully me into learning how <laughs> Board games them. and puzzles. Those are like <sighs> the best. I can do a puzzle. I heard a rumor from Little Birdie that oh. um, one year during that Brazil trip, though, Melissa Tancredi <laughs> ate all of the chocolates out of Rian Wilkinson's advent calendar. Were you a part of that little shenanigan? Um, no, I actually, I actually didn't even know that story or maybe I'm, you know, blocking it out because I don't want to be an accomplice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I was, I will say I was roommates with Tank on one of the, the trips and we brought all the Christmas decorations and our room was pretty epic, like decorated to the nines, Christmas spirit, everything. (laughs) Maybe that was the year and I was just too busy sitting in my Christmas glory. Just enjoying it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You wrote a beautiful thing, uh, a beautiful essay for CBC, and you said, sports are all I've known. Does that scare you in this time of transition when it has just been such a backbone to your entire existence? Uh, no, it doesn't at all, because I know that sports will always be all that I know. Like, it's always going to be a part of it. Um, my role in connection to sports might be different. It might change, um, but they'll always be there, like... I'm always going to be an athlete. I'm always going to try to do every sport that I can um, and push the boundaries with that. But um, I'm also going to stay within the sporting world. You know, I have a lot of um, passions that I want to help continue to to move not only this sport further, um, but just women's sport in general in Canada further. Um, So it's going to be there. Uh, It always has been. Uh, I think, yeah, because my role uh, in connection with it will change, I think that will be challenging and I'll I'll take that as it comes. but I'm also, uh, as I said, like, I feel like I've given everything. And so I think there's not much in me that feels like I have more to give in that sense. So where does soccer need to go in this country? Oof, up, that's for sure. Professional. <laughs> um, that's, that's the simple side of it. I think, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, this team has been successful and, and to continue to like drag it on and um, not give this team in this country what it really needs uh and that's a a place for us to continue to grow and develop more youth soccer players um more players coming through the system uh more opportunities every elite athlete that's got to like the olympics or world cups or, or to the international stage at some point in our lives or in our careers there was an opportunity that was placed in front of us a door was opened and we stepped through it um a professional league in Canada will provide so many more doors and so many more opportunities for more Canadians. Mm -hmm. And the more Canadians that we have being put in positions where they have these opportunities, the more that we're going to grow and develop and the more, um, Jesse Fleming's, Julia Grosso's, Christine Sinclair's we're going to get. And I think that's the exciting part of it is that we've been able to get these types of players coming out of you know, basically a a nothing system to now have the opportunity to have a professional league and have a foundation in place to, to provide more opportunities. I think the, the sky's the limit and the, the excitement of where this team can go consistently is really exciting. What does the next five years look like for you in your dream world? Dream world, the next three to four months are going to be vacation and just <laughs> kicking vacation, back. Bailey's yes. naps. Yes. Hanging out with my dog, hanging out in the mountains, like just enjoying what I've been able to accomplish. Um, and then, yeah, I want to stay in the sporting world. I want to help create a professional league in Canada, continue to be the voice for that and push for change. Um, and then not only soccer, like I want to continue to push women's sport in Canada further. Um, the professional opportunities for female athletes in Canada are very slim to none. Um, so I think, um, you know, it, I have to do my due diligence and, you know, of course soccer's in my heart, but there's so many other athletes around the country that, um, need these opportunities. Um, cause not everyone wants to play soccer and that's okay. Um, but yeah, so I think staying in sport, um, and just continuing to inspire young kids and, and young females to stay in sport. Cause I know, especially now with the, the challenging times, a lot are dropping out and I want to continue to provide um, inspiration for that and, and show how important sports can be um, in life, not only, you know, for the athletic side, but for the mental side, for the emotional side, um, building such amazing friendships and learning such valuable life skills um, through sport. If, professional soccer comes to Canada are you going to come out of retirement and play for Calgary 
A hundred percent. Wait, you're from... Call me up. You're from... <laughs> we're just outside Edmonton. So is yeah. that like a moral yeah, dilemma? Who would you play for? Battle of Alberta. Yeah. We'll, we'll see who... Uh, We'll see what the contracts are looking like. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see where I'm settled in the moment where my, uh, hopefully at that point, wife is, uh, is working and living and um, yeah, we'll make the choice later on. But yeah, I, I mean, the opportunity to play in Canada, that, uh, that might be hard to pass up for a year. You mentioned fiance, wife. Uh, hopefully by that point, Georgia Simmerling, <laughs> you mentioned you went camping after Tokyo. I want to know how uh, you guys camp. Do you glamp or are you like on a cot? No, we camp. We uh, we have a rooftop tent. And so we, you know, sleep in a tent on the roof of the Jeep. I think um, that might be glamping though. I'm sorry, I mean, my dear. it's like maybe a little. And, and I will be honest, like the food we eat, you know, Georgia is a bit of a chef. So the food we're eating is not like, I hot mean, dogs? it's pretty. No, it's not hot, hot dogs. dogs. I would have hot dogs at my wedding. Hot dogs and beans. You know, I did say I wanted to have a wedding with barbecues and like hamburgers and hot dogs. Georgia was like a little bit opposed to that, but... <laughs> But I'm happy with that. You know, I'm Alberta at heart. I'm a country girl. Uh, I'm happy with the Alberta beef and just, yeah, let's get some burgers on the Barbie. <laughs> That's my plan. That's my plan. I appreciate your time so much. Thank you for everything you have done for this country and for athletes, little boys, little girls. Um, just congratulations on such a formidable career. And it, it means a lot that you wanted to sit down and chat today. So thank you, Steph. And uh, I was at the game in Tokyo and uh it was a real special moment for, for everyone. I can promise you that. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Peace. Peace out.